Welcome everyone. That was just a brief video um, detailing some of just the amazing work that Connected and our partners do. So I'm glad everyone could be able to join as people keep uh, coming through. So let's just discuss about what the event is today. So today's event is a follow-up from our first training, which was showing evidence of impact to overcome donor skepticism through strategic storytelling. Today's training will delve deeper into that process, focusing on the storytelling element, demystifying how to construct effective and persuasive stories to therefore overcome donor skepticism and increase the impact of the amazing work that you all do. And luckily today we have three of our uh, NGO partners that will have volunteered to become part case studies to go through the work that they do and Michael will help them. So to go through what the event will be today, the, it will be 90 minutes long, um, which will be led uh, by Michael J. Jordan, who is our instructor of the day. Um, you don't need to have attended the, the first training, although there is a video of that, which is amazing. So I uh, highly encourage you all to check that out. Um, so today, we'll, uh, we'll, Michael will go through the training for the first 30 minutes. Um, and then for the next 30 to 40 minutes, Michael will you, like, work with our NGOs to really uh, use them as a case study. And they have each brought a story. So he'll go through that story and really uh, delve into the process of how to make it a persuasive story to, again, uh, show impact and uh, give evidence to really persuade uh, donors to you know, help the amazing work that you all do. Uh, then at the end, we'll have 10 minutes of uh, Q&A. So towards the end, the end, we can definitely take questions and then uh, put it towards Michael or any of our panelists. So let me get to the introductions. So first of all, my name is Peter McLaughlin. I am um, representing Connected today. Connected is um, a an organization which is really trying to help uh, connect aid with donors and, um, uh, you know, with the NGOs around the world. We're a global organization uh, of consisting of many volunteers and many uh, amazing partners and advocates and ambassadors. Uh, if you really, you can totally join uh, Connected at our connected.network, uh, which I highly recommend you do. We have so much information there of our uh, you know, our NGOs and um, also of our SDGs. So you can go in and we really uh, support and share information on our SDGs. We're also doing a fundraising event to try and gather funds for an amazing trip to support one of our uh, AFXB India to help them. This will, happen, will be happening in August and we will uh, yeah, so that's, we're going to then support our NGO and really help them uh, highlight the amazing work that they do. So keep, a, keep an eye out for all information from that uh, coming up uh, in August. So first of all, let me introduce Michael. So Michael is a New York based specialist in global communications, media relations and executive writing. Uh, Michael, Michael's career has seen him live on four continents across three fields. As a foreign correspondent, he's a former UN correspondent. He also reported from 30 countries in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, uh, and Southern Africa for media outlets like Foreign Policy Magazine, French News Agency, AFP, the Christian Science Monitor, uh, and South Africa's Mail and Guardian. As a visiting professor, he's taught international journalism from New York to Prague to Hong Kong, and most recently at top Chinese universities in Beijing, Shanghai, and Huangsu. As a global communications consultant, he shared his toolkit of skills, strategies, and storytelling with four and nonprofit clients in China and Africa. Having fled Beijing due to COVID, he now serves as vice president of global communications and media relations for North American Ecosystem Institute, advising Chinese companies that are expanding internationally, and is an executive communications writer for the Mekong River Commissions in Laos, as well as International Committee for the Red Cross in Geneva. So welcome, Michael. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, also then to introduce uh, some of the, uh, our you know, volunteer NGOs, uh, we have Dr. Lamondre Pugh, 
who is a passionate speaker, mentor, and recognized leader for the community of people with disabilities. In his current role as CEO of Billion Strong, he brings to the position his natural ability to empower audiences to embrace diversity and create environments where people genuinely belong. He believes that making the world a better place, not only now, but for future generations, is truly what his journey is all about. We also have uh, Harasha Mira, excuse me, Madiraju. He is a geospatial technology evangelist with 17 plus years of experience in marketing and business development in the geospatial industry. In his long tenure at a leading global knowledge organization, Geospatial World, he played various key roles in media and events demonstrating geospatial technologies, roles, and value in the world economy and society. As the Associate Director at the WGIC, he amplifies the value work done by the Association and its members on climate change and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. He also leads strategy, operations and marketing for WGIC. And finally, we have Magic Mandel. Uh, he is the President of Nomada Association, member of the fundraising team responsible for the implementation of the organization's financial strategy, networking, mentoring, and work on social campaigns. Magic all also worked as a Romanian Roman family assistant. Since 2017, he has represented Nomada in the Migration Consortium. Since August 2021, Mandel has been involved in Grupa Granica, a civic movement responding to the humanitarian crisis on the Poland-Belarus border. He leads the Nomada Association through wartime in Ukraine and the mass exodus of its inhabitants to Poland. So, Welcome, please welcome everyone. And we'll learn more about their, um, all of the great work that they do whenever they introduce and delve more into what their uh, NGOs and missions are later on when Michael you know, works with them. So let's begin with Michael. Michael, do, can you please then uh, briefly give us an introduction of uh, what the last training was about? And then let's delve into this training. Great, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for that introduction. And welcome to, to everyone. Uh, uh, on the one hand, those who attended the first session, thank you very much for, for returning. Um, uh, I, won't, I don't want to, to, to bore you by rehashing everything, but for those who are first time attendees, I will give a brief overview of what I discussed the first time. Uh, and, and for those who were, did join one month ago, then this will be reinforcements, okay? What I aim to do, let me share my, my screen just to show you how I've uh, titled this training, Global Communications Part Two, demystifying, I, I love long titles, forgive me for that. Demystifying how to create evidence-driven impact stories that will persuade our smart but skeptical audience. I'll explain each part of the, but the most important thing is that with this session, I do want to demystify the process because I'm often speaking quite theoretically about the need to, 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 to prove that we are as good as we say we are. But in this training, I want to uh, raise the curtain a bit or, or enable you to peek behind the curtain as far as how these stories can be created. Even if you yourself view yourself as not a particularly strong writer um, or, or uh, that you say, I'm not, I'm not a professional, that sort of thing that we all need to, to learn how to better promote ourselves by showing the the activities that we do, especially do well. So let me dive into this. There'll be a um, ju just a quick agenda as I review what is and what is strategic storytelling, why it matters. A quick overview of my skills and strategies. But then I want to dive into specifically a methodology that I developed while living in Southern Africa in Lesotho, the tiny African kingdom of Lesotho. And that's what I want to share with you primarily in this training is th that it serves three purposes. The fork in the road is a communication strategy. It's an interviewing formula and a story storytelling structure that you can ideally would embrace and start to tell your own stories on your organization's website. Then I will give, I'll apply those skills to a few of uh, real life examples of stories that I produced in Southern Africa, then in China, and even now today for the Mekong River Commission in Southeast Asia from my home office here in New York City, okay? Then I'll turn it to, uh, to our panelists as we hear uh, briefly from each one. 
uh, and then I'll, I'll press them a bit for, for real evidence uh, beyond their, their lofty words of what they aim to achieve, hope to achieve, but really uh, detecting some of the real impact on the ground. Uh, and then, like Peter said, uh, if we have some time, I'd love to hear from, from you in the audience if you want me to also apply some of this methodology to your own circumstances, okay? And ideally, by the end, this takeaway that you'll walk away with a roadmap for how to try it yourself, okay? Uh, moving right along. All right, this is a bit of a busy slide, but just as an overarching introduction, that today we are swimming in a sea of brands, okay? Not just the big name corporate brands, but even NGOs are brands. For example, I just wrote a brochure for one of the leading NGO brands, the International Committee for the Red Cross. They are a brand. And individually, we are all brands. Let me explain that. We are all trying to promote ourselves, whether it's to get jobs or to hold on to jobs, to advance in our careers. And what I want to, to explain about that is recognizing that, that we're all now online. Uh, we are, we're no longer just communicating with local audiences, especially when we produce content in English, but we're communicating with a global audience. We have to recognize, as you well know, that online today, there's plenty of misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, fake news, lying, exaggerating by all sorts of brands, whether they be political, governmental, non-governmental, whomever it may be, okay? At the same time, there are supporters and potential supporters out there with money or with services they would like to be able to support us or support an organization on the front lines of some meaningful organ uh, some meaningful issue, but they are skeptical. They know that there are people out there lying and exaggerating, organizations lying and exaggerating. So they demand some form of evidence to prove that you are, that we are as good as we say we are, okay? So then how do we produce that sort of evidence to persuade a skeptical audience, okay? So that is ultimately our objective. And I see this, whether it's our organization's website or even our LinkedIn platform as, individual, as individuals, that we have two primary objectives and challenges. First, to prove we are who we say we are and that we do what exactly we say we do on the one hand, okay? Again, online, you're free to say anything you want, right? But as I tell my students, as long as you back it up with evidence, okay? Then the second challenge is even more difficult, more challenging, is to prove that we are as good as we say we are. Because every single brand, every single organization, even individual professional, has a strong self-interest to say that we are good, that we are very good at what we do. Very few of us would say, I'm actually quite mediocre at what I do. I'm not sure you want to partner with me because I'm so-so. No, no, no. Very few people would, would uh, confess that or organizations would confess that. So then the challenge is, how exactly do we prove that we are as good as we say we are? And that's what I want to get to soon, which is what I call impact stories, evidence-driven, even humanized impact stories, okay? Now, recognizing the, the challenge of who our audience is, as I mentioned during the first session, but it's worth reinforcing that there are essentially two different kinds of audiences out there. Again, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but part of our audience, of the international audience, may be very sheep-like within our own countries, within the international community, many who may just follow blindly, unthinkingly, uncritical thinking, okay? And that appealing to those folks is maybe unsustainable. You can fool them once, shame on us. But fool me twice, then shame on me, okay? If, if we get fooled the second time. The second main audience that we're appealing to, especially if it's supporters, we're looking for supporters, especially financial supporters. That is one of the highest forms of communication, which is to appeal to real critical thinkers. They have a checkbook or cash in their pocket. They're looking for organizations to support, but they're not gonna just follow blindly. They're not, not just going to consume our messages unthinkingly. Okay, and so we have to really think through who exactly this audience is and what are some of the characteristics. As I often say, they're smart, but skeptical. They're also very often non-expert. It's one thing if you're making a presentation to your donors, your uh, stakeholders, those already in the know. 
But again, with your website, with your social media content, whatever it may be, whenever you're dealing with an external audience, keep in mind that they may never have been to the country you're referring to. They may never have actually dived into this issue you're referring to. So then sometimes you need enough context, okay? So they're also non-experts, right? Um, so then it's a question of how to appeal to them. And, and as I'll explain to you today, that two of the most effective ways, and I, I conclude that the only two ways to really appeal to, to persuade a skeptical audience is on the one hand, with cr concrete, credible, believable, even verifiable evidence, okay? Meaning with a hyperlink that we show that we mean what we say, that we have proof. And on the other hand, humanize content to illuminate, to bring light onto the shared humanity, even from thousands of miles away, a very different culture, okay? Because the credible evidence can touch the mind of a skeptic. The humanized content can touch the heart of a skeptic, okay? And again, I will soon give you examples of how to do that. And this is a very important principle that I mentioned over and over again. And with all due respect to our, to our panelists, I see on, on websites like yours, that lots of organizations are telling the audience, we do this, we aim to do that, versus showing, okay? Again, persuading to say, you know what, I, I won't just give you the words, I'll back it up with some actions, some deeds. So show me, don't just tell me. And, and by the way, I didn't want to get uh, too deep into this, because I mentioned this more during the first training session, which again, you can find online. I doubt that the video will go viral, but nevertheless, it's there. I'll share that toward the end, perhaps that I learned all this, all these skills from, from pitching, from selling stories and story ideas to foreign editors, okay? To foreign editors of American and other Western newspapers and magazines, first of all, to persuade them of the value of my story, that it was truly interesting, even important, and then to convince the readers to read and consume. But now we're talking about a different audience. We're not just talking about, at the base level, your websites, and your social media aim to better inform and educate about an issue or to raise awareness. But if you're really gonna climb the ladder to open minds, change attitudes, then change behaviors, but then at the top of the ladder to convince a donor to give money, that is the highest level and you must uh, lower their level of, of suspicion. And I'll start to, to show you how to, to do this. I also want to explain one, I, Again, I'm, I'm um, gonna try to be conscious of time and, and really try to demystify the process, not just be too theoretically. But one thing I wanted to explain, I developed this little strategy here, this intersection of self-interest, I call it, where we have our self-interest, okay? Which is to prove we are who we say we are and that we do what we say we do, to prove that we are as good and impactful as we claim that we are, then we ain't, our self-interest is to impact more people. And then to impact more people, we need to attract more funds to impact more people. But to be truly effective in any form of communications, it also starts with empathy. This is actually one of my most important skills that I mentioned over and over again ad nauseum, okay? Which is we, we must start to be empathetic and imagine ourselves in the shoes of our target audience. In this case, in the shoes, let's say, of the highest uh, uh, target audience, the donor. What's in it for them? Why would they give? Okay, why are they here? Why are they potentially our audience? To contribute to credible, meaning believable organizations with capacity that prove that we have the ability, okay, even the staff to take on what we're promising to do on the front lines, okay, even breaking down each part of the sentence that we're actually out there doing it. We're not just way in the back talking about the issue, we're actually doing what we say we're doing, okay? So they're looking to contribute. Why? Maybe they have a self-interest to prove to a skeptical public, or they need to prove to a government that they're taking steps to donate, to give money to work for corporate social responsibility, or ESG, or DEI, whatever the, the acronyms of the day are, okay? Or they need to prove to their shareholders or other stakeholders that they are also supporting not for profit, but impactful causes. And they may be looking for, ideally, a win-win. They're looking for something that's good for them, primarily. They're not do-gooders if they're a for-profit organization, let's say, or even not for profit. 
they're looking at something to promote themselves, maybe to, to help your organization move along, but also then the beneficiary. So actually I should say create a win, win, win. Then the question is, if we have these over, overlapping self-interest, theirs and ours actually overlaps, okay? So can we push the right button? And then as I say, oh, as I say down here, both sides have a need to persuasively convince a skeptical, even suspicious audience. And an impact story can be a win-win that proves impact for both sides, okay? Now, one more thing before I get to the examples. And I will talk about this today. I developed also a four-step formula, which I named immodestly the Jordan four-step formula, okay? And first of all, for each of you, I would encourage you, whenever you're talking about communications as a team, your internal staff, first of all, who exactly is our target audience, okay? And why are they our audience? What are they looking for and why? How would they benefit? What's their self-interest, okay? Or else why are they our audience? Why else do they care about this? I imagine that each of you attended today because you have a self-interest, okay? You're not just doing it to support me, for example, okay? But second, then we get to, to, to the heart of this. Once we've identified our target and we can aim now more accurately and efficiently at our target, what exactly do we want to say about ourselves? What message, what arguments, what point do we want to make? Do we want to deliver directly to their heart, to their mind about us? Maybe it's what story do we want to tell? But then to justify and defend, why exactly do we want to make that point or that argument? How exactly do we want to, why exactly do we want to deliver these points, okay? And this is very important. I thought through because I, I've experienced this with several organizations. This is a tough self-assessment as far as, yeah, what exactly are we trying to do and why? But then to think about the audience, here's a filter. These are very important filters here, which is why exactly would our audience, would our reader find what we're saying to be interesting or important? or persuasive, why exactly would they be receptive to what we're saying, okay? Then, then once we think through and we defend and justify why exactly we're saying what we're saying, then the fourth and final step is the how. How exactly do we want to deliver this point or this message or make this argument? With what story, what evidence, what details, what, what facts, what uh, uh, photos, what videos, what graphs? anything to make an argument. As I often say, this is like a lawyerly argument. To truly convince a donor to write us a check, okay, to open their pocketbook to us, that we, we must make a lawyerly argument as if we're in a courtroom with a judge and a jury to persuade them. And we can't just say to the judge, your honor, my client is innocent. Trust me, believe me, that's not enough. You say, my client is innocent, here's exhibit A, exhibit B, exhibit C. Three concrete, credible, even verifiable pieces of evidence to persuade the judge and jury that we are as good as we say we are and that your money will help us continue to do what we're doing, our good deeds on the ground, okay? Now, moving right along, I wanna to get to the Africa example, okay? And how I began to produce these uh, these impact stories. So I lived from 2011 to 2015, I was living in this tiny uh, African kingdom high in the mountains of Southern Africa, Lesotho, lived there for four years. I followed my, my, my uh, wife, my then wife, working for the UN, okay? She was a top UN official, I followed as did our children. So then among the things I was doing was, was uh, various, um, I moved into health communications, health and development communications, working with various uh, non-governmental and intergovernmental organizations like the UN, but others, as I'll, as I'll soon explain. This is a photo of mine, just to give some idea of what the, the mountain folks, the Basutu people of Lesotho look like. They're, they're, many of them are cowboys riding uh, horses and donkeys between their mountaintop villages. Anyway, it was there in Lesotho that I first began to apply my skills of international journalism to global communications. And I realized it was also there that I had this revelation, this epiphany, that all organizations like yours also need to think like an international journalist. You have something interesting, something even important happening over here. We need to 
raise awareness. We need to catch the attention of the international community. How exactly do we do that? It's, we can't just spit out facts and details because the audience doesn't consume that too easily. They, they're very receptive to storytelling, okay? To consume content in a storytelling form, but supported by evidence, wrapped around a core message, okay? So this was, uh, just briefly, this was the first, um, one of my first assignments, it was for UNICEF, okay? The UN Agency for Children, where they brought me in, they needed help writing their fundraising proposals for HIV. I forgot to mention, Lesotho so at that time suffered from the world's second highest rate of HIV infection, 23%. 23% HIV in the country among all sexually active population, but also 40% malnutrition among their children. 40% of the babies and toddlers were suffering stunting of the brain and body because of malnutrition. Okay, very severe hardship. So I was brought in to help write these proposals regarding HIV transmission from mother to child, regarding immunizations and regarding malnutrition. And as I asked my, my local Basutu colleagues for UNICEF, please describe the situation in the mountains, I could see that they struggled to really bring it to life. Here we are trying to communicate to donors in New York and Washington, London, Paris, Berlin, and elsewhere, why exactly? Why exactly do we need mobile health clinics, okay, to travel from village to village? And I asked, why are they needed? And my, my Basutu colleague said, because access to health care is very challenging. I said, what does that mean? What does access to health care mean? If I ask each of you, what, is, what do you think that means? You may each have a, your own definition. So I said, please bring this to life. Paint a picture for me. I haven't yet been into the villages and the mountains to see what it's like. Then they describe the unpaved roads. OK, the, the, the rocky mountains and then the valleys and the rivers and and oh, the nearest health clinic is up and over that mountain peak. It may take two, three, four, five hours for a pregnant woman or for a granny or for a sick child to be carried by horseback or donkey back or wheelbarrow. I once saw a granny brought with her son, bringing her by wheelbarrow to the nearest health clinic. And I thought, well, I need to bring that to life. OK, so that was where my first revelation was. And I wrote about this on my LinkedIn platform, how to apply journalism skills to global communications, okay? Now moving right along, I don't wanna to take too much time, but I want to talk about some of the, the lessons learned. So then I began my most memorable project for an organization called Management Sciences for Health, okay? And this organization, Management Sciences for Health, had a five-year project. This is where I lear learned and developed my fork in the road methodology. They had a five-year program to help HIV orphans and caregivers, okay? As a, again, they, the country suffers from the world's second highest rate of HIV. So there were thousands of HIV orphans there and caregivers dealing with, it could be a grandmother that the, mo that the daughter and, and, and son-in-law had died of HIV. Now the grandmother's caring for the five grandchildren or it could be a community leader now caring for all the orphan children in the village, that sort of thing. So this or American organization was funding different local organizations. And they said, Michael, after five years, we need to prove to our donors in Washington in, and in New York that we've actually had some impact over these five years. And of course, we want, we want the money to continue to flow. We must overcome their skepticism about whether we've done any real good and had any lasting impact, okay? And so then as I went up into the villages, into the mountains and, and into these villages, I met women like this woman and I developed a methodology, okay? I interviewed her, I, I thought through with my colleagues and this is something that, that I'm, we'll, we'll go through a bit in a few minutes, but I, I would encourage each organization to do, which is internally to start to identify, well, what, what does impact look like? If we are successful with our beneficiaries, okay, what would our impact even look like? We want them to do what? To live a happier life, an empowered life, an independent life, uh, a healthier life? What exactly would it look like, okay? And then once we identify that, well, then how do we have evidence that we've actually done that sort of thing? Do we have numbers? Do we have facts and figures to prove we've had that impact? And then 
if we do, okay, Michael, go out there and tell some of the stories of the people we've helped, okay? So then with women like this, I, I began to realize it's simply a case of, before, another way to look at my fork in the road is a, it's a question of the before and the after. Before you intervene, your organizations intervened in their lives, their life was what? They described the way their life was before. And then, here, let me slide down to the fork in the road for a second to show you. I developed it as a diagram that for each of you, you can describe We can, uh, for, for each of you, uh, you can describe the way their life was before, before, uh, before you got involved with their, uh, uh, with their lives. Maybe you invited them to a program, a training, a workshop, or literally knocked on their door to assist them. You can describe them. You can ask them what their life was like before. Then why exactly their life was like this? Have them describe. Here's what our organization's situation was like. Here's what our company's situation was like. Here's what my life was like before. And then, so this is before the arrow, okay? Then they're living their lives. They're walking along. And then there's a literal or figurative knock on the door. That is the intervention. That's when they first come across your organization. You reach out to them. Maybe they reach out to you. They face a decision. They face a crossroads here, a fork in the road. They could ignore what you have to say. They could ignore your program and your services and all that. And then you could ask them, I'm curious, if you hadn't gotten involved, if you hadn't taken this advice, what would your life have continued to be like, okay? On the other hand, you, you decided to, you, you were receptive to this intervention, to this, uh, to this knock on the door, and then step by step, how did your life change? How exactly was your life impacted? And then we, as storytellers, start to document step by step. Our organization helped them that, this way and that way, okay? So with this, for example, with this woman, just as one example, as I said here, that she was, she was HIV positive, okay? And she became pregnant and she worried that she might have an HIV positive baby. But at the same time, there was, a village, uh, there was a meeting of village healthcare workers. They were going door to door, inviting all the young women and middle-aged women, please come to our training, come down to the health clinic, that if you are HIV positive, if you're at risk of becoming HIV positive, if you are pregnant or hope to become pregnant, please come to our training and we'll explain how we can lead you through the process of pregnancy without, even if you are HIV positive, how to prevent your baby from becoming HIV positive. This woman agreed, okay? So here I am in her home. I want to, again, demystify. I'm in her home with an interpreter and I spent about two hours, Okay, it was quite a painstaking process, but as I'm asking the questions through the interpreter, it's being translated, I'm getting each and every detail step by step, not her entire life story, but the relevant details, the necessary details leading up to, first of all, the background, leading up to how, how then she attended this training at the health clinic, okay? And even, by the way, one thing I was doing, even with an interpreter, of course, that adds time if you need to work with an interpreter. But at the same time, I was taking photos while she's listening, while she's answering, I'm taking photos, which, of course, help enhance the story. This one, this photo I shot of her straight on, okay? But this photo, for example, I shot during the interview, okay? A nice lively photo of her in action uh expressing herself and michael, so michael is there sorry michael is there specific things that we should include within these stories i'm just being cognizant of time so Thank that you. like for yes. one of those that like how to really construct these stories is there specific points that should really be included yes 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 thank you for that so let me explain a couple more details okay because I can also send links to the, 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 the group uh, uh, to show some of these stories, okay? That recognizing, I call this the Darwinian 
This is the Darwinian storytelling as well. I call it, named it after Darwin, of course, who is famous for exploring the origins and evolution of, of species. In this case, I recognize, we should recognize that no story happens overnight, no situation or issue happens overnight, that each story and situation and individual story has a deep past, a more recent past, and then the present. So I ask and, and encourage each of you, even to start an interview, in the back with, with with the background okay where does your story begin okay and then and not just where does it begin but why does it begin there then how did your story change over the years how does it evolve okay the origins to the evolution and explain why your situation evolved the way it did back up to the present where you are today and why you are where you are today and then you can finish the story with where this person is going from here this itself is a storytelling structure. But to answer Peter's question, this is the most important thing about the, about the fork in the road that, I want, uh, that I'll explain now when I get to, to your, your individual case studies too, is that let's say you've, been, you've helped hundreds or thousands of people. In this situation, they had me interview 24 people, but this represented hundreds of their beneficiaries. You can identify, let's say your organization's three main activities, and then you find one story, one person who symbolizes, this is really the key, okay? Because if you've helped thousands of people, I'm not saying produce a feature story, an impact story on all thousand of these people. No, you can find a few revealing, illuminating examples that symbolize, like this one woman, she, then I could say, I could open with her story, okay? A few sentences, a, a couple paragraphs, and then she is one of hundreds of beneficiaries who, who receive services from uh, Management Sciences for Health, okay? That then you're connect, as I say, you open small with an individual story, but then you, you recognize the symbolism of what that person re represents, and then you connect the dots between that person and the many others whom you've trained and assisted or somehow intervened and impacted, okay? But then when you say she is one of hundreds or thousands or millions positively affected, then you hyperlink, you insert a link to your evidence to prove that you have actually assisted that many people, okay? Peter, is, is, is that clear enough? Yes, I think so. I think that's the perfect segue to go to one of our uh, NGOs to actually then highlight all what you are, um, you know, the, the, the journey of finding out those details. So from our first one, uh, we had uh, Lamondre from uh, Billion Strong in our first uh, training. So it's really yeah. great to therefore have the continuity to see therefore what the impact of the first training had on you guys, Lamondre, and then also to sort of learn how to we delve deeper and really construct and create these stories to make a compelling argument. So Lamondre, if you could uh, just introduce yourself uh, or Billion Strong, and then you and Michael can work through uh, your story. Absolutely. First of all, I am again honored uh, to be here. I am a black man with a bald head, a full beard, and I am seated in my power wheelchair as a result of spinal muscular atrophy. And I am the CEO of Billion Strong. Billion Strong is a global nonprofit organization that's focused on identity, the identity of who? The identity of people with disabilities. There are, according to the World Health Organization, there are 1.3 billion people on the planet who are identified as people with disabilities. Now, you hear that that is a huge number, 1.3 billion people. That's a huge number. But I will tell you that number is woefully inadequate because the truth is some estimate it's probably in the range of about 2 billion people actually on the planet living with some form of disability. Well, why the reason for this disparity in, in, in the numbers? Well, it's, it's quite simple. Um, a lot of times it's because countries and regions simply don't have standards in terms of how they report disability. 
Some of it is because of the confusion of who is a person with a disability. But the one that we really kind of focus in on is the fact that many people refuse to identify as people with disabilities. Why? Because of the stigma, because of the shame, because in many places in the world, they still view disability as, as a curse, as something to be looked down upon. But let's think about that 1.3 billion number just real quick. That's a lot of people. Imagine what could happen if 1.3 billion people came together and spoke with a unified voice. Imagine what, could, what kind of empowerment really could be realized if we all came together in steps billion strong. That's why we exist. We exist to connect people and to empower people. In fact, we like to call it empowerment through connection. And that's what we are. Our goal is to, is to elevate, to unite, and empower the global community of people with disabilities through connections so that we can come together, use a unified voice, and create effective change, not only for us as individuals, but for our communities, for our societies, and ultimately for our world. So check us out, really, billion-strong.org. Sorry, that, I was just going to say that must be really difficult then if you have 1.3 billion people with disabilities and for you guys to make an impact, how do you really, you know, pick a story to highlight that impact? Right. And that's one of the things that we that that's one of the issues that we're talking about uh, as well, because the other piece of that and we are having impact. But the other piece of that is that we are a new organization. We are a new organization. So. The idea behind it is, okay, we're in the process of constantly making impacts. So our impacts are growing. As Michael said, you know, you start with a deep story and you kind of go through the evolution of it all. My question really for this particular, uh, for this particular training is how do we begin to identify uh, how we move forward in this? So that's exactly what I want to talk about today. Good. What would you advise, Michael? Yes, thank you. So, so can everyone see that I, that I put up the Billion Strong website? Yes, yes, we can. One thing I mentioned last time, and, and I'll reiterate for those who are, uh, are first-time attendees to the, the training. One thing I think that every organization, even every company should have at the top of the website should even be a special category that says our impact. Okay, because again, if we know that our audience is going to be skeptical, all right, then right away, let's, let's overcome, try to overcome some of that skepticism by showing some of our real on the ground impact. Okay, so now me, when I'm visiting these websites, I am a skeptic, but I'm also looking through the lens of even a, a, a foreign correspondent, an international journalist who may be writing about this. And I've come across lots of NGOs that are not nearly as impactful as they say they are, right? So I'm reading from the top, Lamondre. I'm reading from the top, right? It's an identity and empowerment organization designed to bring together billions of voices, right? So that's aspirational, okay? That also celebrating our allies and, and, uh, and accomplices. So I'm looking for, again, as a skeptic, I'm like, okay, show me some example right now, some evidence of how you've empowered people, mm -hmm. right? Somehow how you've touched people. I go to the next page, the about section. OK, and now you start to give a clear idea. As to as to what you're you're doing, can everyone see this page? Did it jump effectively? Yes. OK, yes. yes. So so now you're saying that we are aiming to unite, elevate and power. OK, to develop a positive identity to come together and to create positive change. OK, now, to be fair. If you're saying that you are a new organization, like, whoa, 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 give us a chance, give us time, right, before we have true impact. That's one thing, right? But so far, you haven't given that impression. And, and, and I'm trying to look past the aspirational, what we're aiming for, and I'm looking for what you've achieved already. Right. Okay? And I think there's value to including a hyperlink. If, if you don't have that section uh, uh, at the top of the website saying our impact. And even within here, you can insert some hyperlinks so you're signaling to the audience, hey, this isn't just words, 
click here for evidence right now of what we're doing and how we're doing it. Okay. Right. So what I would do, Lamandre, and, and understand that you guys are a relatively new organization. Okay. Is that from this moment forward, I would say whenever we do any activity, any program, any training or workshop, any outreach, we must start to document it. We must start to chronicle it somehow, okay? And it's one thing to look back. If you say, and I, I'm, I'm, I have no reason to doubt you, if you say we're already impacting people, right? Then you and Deborah and your team internally, again, it starts with that conversation. First of all, what would our impact look like? Mm -hmm. right? Like right now you say we've impacted people. I could press you and say, in what way? And, and, not, just, and not just impact people like, wow, you're a wonderful organization. I like you guys. This was great. I learned a lot. But I think donors are looking for lasting impact, that you're planting right. seeds towards sustainability, that my donation is not going to just be, you know, fly out the window or be flushed down the toilet like a one off. But it's, right. it's building towards something. Right. Right. So even uh, even for our audience to know, I'm happy that Lamandre is on this panel today because he had said again our first training was one month ago and he said that the first training my first training had some positive impact on the organization so if i were there if, if uh, even on behalf of connected i would say lamandre okay there was that fork in the road you and deborah and billy and strong were on your fork in the road here was our situation maybe we're struggling with donations we're struggling to, to get the word out about who we are what we're doing and all that and then we heard about your training there's a fork in the road. We decided to take your advice regarding impact stories or to reorient our strategic communications approach. And then step by step, we did this, then we did that, then we did right. Then we decided to hire a writer to, to produce some stories, some impact stories, okay? And by the right. way, I want to make clear that I would suggest not just one story because one story could be a unique situation, a one-off, an aberration, two stories, could be a coincidence. We, you know, this organization has positive, positively affected, impacted two people. But we say journalistically, the rule of threes. As soon as something happens three times, whether it's a lightning strike or a pit bull attack or anything that I've written about, then, then there's a pattern, there's a trend. Right. So, so we say at least, there should be at least three stories. At least three stories. Right. If not five, eight, ten, that sort of thing. And what so I would also... Go sorry. Ahead. No, I just was uh, curious as to ultimately how is it important for NGOs to define what their impact is? Because for me, in, in looking at Billion Strong, as, as Michael would say, being very lofty, but is, is your goal to have more employment for those with disabilities, for example? Or, and then also I would ask Michael, like, you know, do you need a story per... Um, like disability in the sense of we're helping people who are blind, we're helping people who are in wheelchairs. Is it is it valid to, whenever you're saying to have three stories, is it to show the breadth and scope? Is that the idea behind that I, behind that uh, concept? Yes, I mean, it's, I, I often use the word symbolism, right? And, and the symbolic value of someone's experience that, that if I were, Lamandre and, and, and Deborah running the organization, I would say, okay, what are our three most important activities, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then we think about that. What are the three that we truly want to promote that that's our bread and butter, our specialty, right? And that we right. know we've had programs and services in, in each of the fields. And we know that some of the individuals have stood out to us, someone who became a true believer, or then they, you had them in a training and they went back and became a community leader for the disabled in their own community. And you say, you know what? That person, of course, is unique and interesting in their own way. They're special in their own way, but they actually symbolize, they represent what we are doing, what we're aiming to do. So let's tell their story as to what their situation was like before, especially we want to show how we're empowering people. Well, then right. let's ask them in the story, please describe for me how before you felt unempowered, you felt right. weak powerless before before i felt i was discriminated against i was treated this way i was treated that way blah 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 but then a knock on the door i learned about billion strong i attended her training their workshop etc etc then i went back home and i did this i did that 
And then you can show simply before and after. And then as you're telling that story, and this is really literally within the first 100, 200 words, because that's the first full screen of a computer screen or of a phone, one 200 words into it, Lamandra, you can say, and they are, they're not alone. They are one okay. of 1,000 people who have now attended. Billions and see, and that's the thing. We have stories. We have stories like that that we're building now. That's what I wanted to ask you about. For example, in the middle of the pandemic, and this will be really quick, I promise. In the middle of the pandemic, um, we were contacted um, by a group uh, that was really based out of Kenya to provide some training uh, specifically centered around accessibility for women with disabilities in Kenya. It was a small group. However, this kind of training was not was not available for them before. This is something that we provided. Now, you have to understand just by simply giving them that kind of training, helping them to understand the perspective to approach accessibility from, particularly when you're talking about intersectionality, open their world up. And honestly, it gave them a different, a different point of view. The second thing that we're doing right now that is a part of a, a part of who we are, we partner with a number of different organizations. And there is one particular organization called Younger that focuses on connecting decision makers with young people, with youth. Here's the thing, they didn't have very much or they wanted to delve more deeply into the disability space because it's all about inclusion and so often disability is left out of inclusion. So we're making that connection and we're getting applicants from around the world because of that. Now, here's the thing, the result of that connection has been, or the impact of that connection is now they have so many more people with disabilities involved in the advocacy training program, which would not have happened before. Now, the deeper thing of that is we know that that means that there will be more impact that comes out of that for individuals. So this right. is what I mean. We're in that that space where we're doing things in this active, but we're still looking also for the deeper impact as well. OK, so so, you know, baby steps. Right. So you're planting seeds. Right. And I, I love the idea of, let's say, the, the Kenyan example. Right. So then you'd want to find one of those people, okay, to to really humanize the story. They, you make it a character-driven story, so right? you don't just talk about the organization, which is more abstract. You said the, the person who approached you, right? Please describe for me what the inaccessibility was like. They come to you for help with to make it more accessible, to make society more accessible. Please paint us a picture for our international audience, which may never have been to Kenya before. Please describe the inaccessibility for those with, disabled, with disabilities, even through your own experience. Let's say they themselves are in a wheelchair, right? Here in Kenya, I was, you know, I, I, I grew up in a wheelchair, the X, Y, Z happened to me, and there are, on the side, there are no ramps on sidewalks, there's no this, there's no that, to get on a bus is very difficult at de describing. Then one day, I learned about Billion Strong. I reached out, we organized a training in which I got together my friends and colleagues and virtually we began to do X, Y, Z, okay? So that's one way, just one example, right? That one story, and then we can start to connect the dots. You're, you're still in your organization's infancy, right? But I love the idea of showing how, how the seeds are being planted and nurtured and cultivated, but you're also putting a human face on the work that you're doing. And then of course you're asking them during this interview, and then what happened? Then what happened? And now, how do you feel about it? Do you feel more empowered, let's say? Do you feel right. more respected? Okay. So that, so that goes to your fork in the road mentality, as in like, what was life before Billion Strong? What is yeah. life now after Billion Strong? And yeah. therefore that describes the impact that a Billion Strong has had. So that should really be at the start of their impact story. But it requires, it requires with the, with the interview, it requires some curiosity and some real detective work, which is, and then what happened? And then what happened? That's right. why I, I say these interviews can be maybe two hours, one, two, three hours. Like I need to understand fully and clearly what exactly happened. Then I can tell your story. Okay. I can write it for you, even in your voice, but then I can write it. So you don't put the pressure on them to write it. We can write it in there. You, you hire someone or you train your staff to do this. Okay. But uh, that's how, yes, that's how I would do it.
Lamondre. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much and I will, and I will tell you this, man. That the impact of the training that we had before is changing the way that we communicate about our organization. Period. Not just in our websites either, but just period. So thank you. Well, can I just ask? I mean, but but how so? In what way is well, it changing? I think I, I think what it does is it, it's almost like changing from selling to really telling. And what I mean by that is we want to talk about the statistics. We have to do that. We have to talk about what the problems are. We have to do that. But I think that it's much more about and how do we solve that problem? Not, not, not the hows in terms of the ABCs, but what does that problem solve to look like for people and how have we impacted that? And that's the difference. That's a shift. You know, because before it was all about, okay, so these are the statistics. This is what the problem is. Because you feel like people just don't know. But then if you're the answer, show me. So that's how that's changing our conversation. That's the impact. And, and may I add to that, that, that Lamandre, you know, if you think about the audience and just the value, the communications value of humanizing stories, because behind all those statistics, behind all those issues and challenges are real people living real lives and their families are affected as well, right? And so then right. there is something about tugging at the heartstrings Right. We all love a good story. And when you think about our own reading habits and what our own eyes are drawn to and all the competition for our eyeballs, that somehow if you can bring those statistics to life, those facts and figures right. to life in a humanized way, then we're delivering messages in a very subtle way. It's not just great text here. Look at the data. OK, but right. data driven storytelling is what this right. becomes. Okay. Thank that. you so much, Lamont. Thank you. So Thank you. let's move on to Magic from uh, Migration Consortium. So Magic, can you uh, describe your uh, organization and then we can delve into how uh, Michael can help you guys with your mm -hmm. um, storytelling to develop a persuasive argument. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I represent Migration Consortium from Poland. It's a group of nine NGOs. Um, we run it since 2017. It was our response on European refugee crisis in 2015, uh, when uh, we almost collapsed as an organization dealing with migration processes in Poland because of changing of the government and tensions in Europe. We lost funds, we almost closed our organizations. So we met and decided to do something together. We didn't know in the beginning, I remember we met in, it was in Bratislava in Slovakia. We were guests of a conference. So we met in a hotel, like four stars hotel, but we ran away from the meeting and we drink wine on the top of the building and we decided to build it, to run it. And <clears throat> first two years were the time where we, when we decided to meet each other because from my perspective, that was a um, group of people who need support. First, they need to know each other better and support each other to redefine how to support vulnerable groups for instance, refugees or asylum seekers. Mm. Then we started to run projects, like first time in, in Poland, we um, cover all refugee centers in the country with the, um, with the free of charge legal advice, advising, legal counseling. Uh, and we started to build stronger connections between each other because we, we run nine organizations in Poland in different parts of the country, close to the Eastern border, close to the Western border. That's very important now. I'm, I'm gonna go, go, go to this point very soon. And uh, then COVID happened. So we started to meet like today, talk, each, talk with, each other via Zoom or any other platform. And what we did with this time when we could not, yeah, it was two years without um, meeting in real time, in like 
we met in real time, but in real. Uh, so we <clears throat> prepared uh, um, a draft, I would say, a draft of Polish migration policy addressed to government. Um, and one year ago, almost like 10 months ago, it was 16th of August. We were like a few days before consultation that we planned to um, before we before we decided before we will present our proposal to government we will discuss it with uh, all sector whole sector non governmental other non governmental organizations not only dealing with um, migration issues but we met on 16 August because local people from western from from eastern Poland started uh, they faced <clears throat> irregular migration via Polish Be Poland Belarus border. So they called, alarmed us. Mm, we met like with 20, 20, 20, more than 20 people from organizations. And in two hours meeting, we decided after this five years of cooperation, we could, we did it very fast. And Two days ago, first groups of people, of volunteers from our organization started to deliver uh, help uh, to irregular migrants across, that crossed Poland-Belarus border. And day by day, Polish government and their authorities started to be more mm, harmful towards migrants and towards activists working on, in, on the border. So, okay, long story short, after 10 months, we, deal, we are dealing with the biggest humanitarian crisis in Polish history on Polish borders, um, run somehow, somehow run by Belarusian and Polish government. And what NGOs did, we, I would say we, we ran a, a civic movement, it's called Grupa Granica, the border group, it's, there are people who provide humanitarian uh, aid uh, in the field without, without uh, these biggest organizations. No one uh, started to provide help, you know, that local people and activists still doing it. Mm, yeah, we saved 11,000 people. We just finished our statistics, like 11,000 normal people who want to live normal life in Europe. But they became uh, they became victims of of um, Belarus system of Polish racist response on this crisis, and in the same time, like during this crisis, twenty fourth of February this year, we will remember this date uh, for a long time. Russia invades invade Ukraine, and we started to deal with another crisis. Mm. Since that day, four million people crossed Ukraine and Polish border. And what we did as organizations, we started to deal with this challenge as well. So our, our network, and now we provide humanitarian aid in whole um, Eastern border and in our in Polish cities. Mm. Yeah, we, we learn how to work like, like humanitarian organizations. We never did that. So from the last year, we learned a lot, I think. Uh, like, well, yeah. what did, I, yeah, sorry. What, what kind yeah. of humanitarian aid? Yeah. Hmm? What, what, kind of, what kind of aid? What kind of humanitarian aid? What does impact look like for you guys? Um, from the beginning, we, mm, we, we matched, P, we matched people fl fleeing, U fleeing Ukraine with um, Polish families. I remember my organization, Nomada, locally in Wrocław, for first two days, did it um, on her own without any support from government or local government. Just we, yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> now I just find this is the impact. We uh, catalyzed somehow the local community, you know, like, Every Pole, every Pole were a volunteer that, those days. 
like whole society we have with uh, mm, it's it, yeah it's 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 powerful thing yeah that we we provide this uh, help to 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 people running so michael running. how would you advise magic yeah. and their organization mm -hmm. See, this is a great example of, of for Masiak and his colleagues to, to think through, okay, what exactly is our impact, right? To identify humanitarian assistance. What does that mean? Because we're also trying to communicate that to the outside world. What exactly, you know, again, with all our attendees here, we may all have a different definition of, of what is humanitarian assistance, right? Or rescuing, rescuing someone, right? Mm -hmm. So first of all, you're identifying, you're also saying, oh, we also catalyze local communities to take in let's say refugees into their homes, okay? So whatever it may be, in this situation, let me, let me just quickly show the audience. This is your website, correct, Masiek? Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, again, if I just hear about the Migration Consortium or the Migrant Cor Consortium, right? I, I'm reading, I'm a skeptic, right? I'm reading, working for migrants and refugees. Okay, show me, don't just tell me, show me, right? We respect, we're, we're, we're fighting for respect for the dignity of all people, show me. Providing protection, show me. Strengthening the sense of solidarity of Polish women, show me. Building community, show me, okay? Now here, look, eventually, once you start to produce these stories, you could have a hyperlink beneath each of these, right? Don't just take my word for it. Click on there. To, to, and we'll show you the stories mm -hmm. of the real people and real communities where we're impacting. In this situation, Masiek, okay? Mm -hmm. If you're saying we need, you're speaking with your team, we need more funding support mm -hmm. for our humanitarian services on the border, okay? Yeah. We need yeah. to identify at least three people and their families, but three individuals whom we've helped, mm -hmm. right? And, and got them right uh, on, on a better path on a safer, healthier, more stable path, right? One of them, please tell me your story, okay? And it could be that you start in their past. You know, we had a comfortable life, my wife and, and two children. I was doing this, she was doing that. Our kids love to play football and, and computer games. Then the airstrike, then the shells began to fall and we ran and for three days we were on foot crossing the border through muddy rivers and fields and all that. We were scared, we knew no one in Poland. And then we were approached by this organization. I mean, I'm just making all that up right now, right? But this is from the interview. Then what happened, then what happened, then what happened? Then there's a fork in the road. Do we trust this, My, you know, you're asking, then what happened? Did, did you trust this organization? Did you take their advice? Did you follow them or continue on your way? What would have happened if you hadn't? Who knows what would have, we could have been trafficked. We could have uh, been, been victimized somehow in Poland. We took their advice, step by step, they found us a home. They, they provided us with healthcare services, even psychological services, even food. They gave us food stamps and food and boxes of food. They did this, they did. And now my wife is volunteering and I'm also working delivering food. And so, so you're showing the seeds that you've been planting, right? And then you can say, this is the first few paragraphs, right? And then you, and then you can say, and they are one of, of 13,000 families you've assisted so far, okay, mm -hmm. right? It's not just about them. Yes, with all due respect, they are interesting. They're special in their own way, but you're identifying these stories for their symbolic value, that they symbolize one of thousands, okay, or hundreds. Michael, case Michael what is the best way to actually really do that? Is it one of those, like, you know, is it best through actual stories? Do people engage and read as much? Or should it be videos where it's in the people's own words? Like, what is the best way for a migration consortium to really get that point across visually also? I mean, that's a great point. If, if you have the resources, of course, Masiak, you know, you can do a multimedia, you know, mm -hmm. that, that you make sure. Again, I'm telling organizations from this point forward, you must prioritize, which is we must document these things, minimally writing them down, but also take photos, also shoot videos, right? You could stream interviews, right? You're, you know, you're, you're with, with the communications punch, you're squeezing as much value. First of all, you recognize the value of these stories. They're not just stories. 
they are pieces of evidence, right? That, that you think this is part of our lawyerly argument. It's not just cute, cuddly storytelling, right? Let's tell stories we're recognizing. No, we must capture these as, as pieces of evidence for our lawyerly, lawyerly argument. And yes, of course, Peter, uh, I would say, do all of it if you can, right? But minimally, these stories could be three, four, 500 words, okay? Tell, humanizing the real story, I hate to say go for the tears, but sure, try to evoke some from, some tears from the, the audience. But then the key is that you connect the dots. It's not just three individual stories. What does that mean? No, it's three individual stories that then represent mm -hmm. the bigger picture of what you're doing. You said before, Masik, that uh, also with, with migrants that you uh, helped uh, rescue 11,000 or 13,000. If you say, hey, this is another important part of what we do or for Roma rights, for the, the ethnic Roma community and all that, we also do X, Y, Z. We need a story representing that. We need a story representing that. Each of them symbolic, then connecting the dots, supported by our evidence, right? And that sort of thing, to show that we're not just having impact, but planting seeds toward lasting impact and sustainability. Is that is that clear enough? Yeah, thank you. I made, I made notes, you know? <laughs> we or should... watch the recording over and over again after this. <laughs> Thank right. you so much, Masek. And so now we'll go on to Harsha. So Harsha, if you can really uh, uh, give us uh, a background from the work that the WGIC does, and then uh, Michael will also help you guys within how to really evoke uh, a powerful story. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I guess you guys can hear me. Can you confirm? Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael, for this opportunity. Uh, so, in brief, uh, WGIC uh, is or uh, the World Geospatial Industry Council is a global, not-for-profit trade association. Uh, we are funded by private sector companies working in the geospatial sector. Uh, we have three key goals and objectives. Uh, the first one is to strengthen the contributions of uh, geospatial industry to society and global economy. The second one is uh, to advance uh, global policy matters relevant for the geospatial sector. And the third one is to create business opportunities for the geospatial industry. So these, these are the three key goals. And in terms of, uh, uh, and uh, one, one thing I want to tell to Michael is that I have attended the first, uh, not attended the first webinar, but I went to the uh, recording and I, and one good thing is at the same time, we are now working on uh, reworking on our communication met, uh, messaging in our website. And uh, if you would allow, I would uh, now share my screen briefly okay. rather than you sharing the screen because uh, Michael, you already looked at, at our website, but I would like to show on what I learned, right? from uh, uh, what you have uh, put, uh, you have been talking about and how did i how i am uh, am i now trying to communicate this uh, as uh, into my uh, things right so if you can see my screen right the my, michael the first thing you told about is to have that r impact thing right ahead on the yes. menu Right, on. right. So yeah. this is the this is the zero uh, version zero wireframe that I've just created yesterday. So yes. uh, uh, we would now have our impact, our network, and knowledge resources, at the, yes. and then one key message: what we are right addressing global challenges and advancing geospatial ecosystem. These are the two key things that we do. And again, the key uh, call for message is uh, calling members to join uh, as a member and uh, for others to join on our mailing list. And then as we go, we see here. Uh, we want to communicate our impact, right? So we are saying our, pos our programs positively impact society and the global economy and help the geospatial ecosystem thrive. So these are the two key things we do. So uh, on addressing global challenges, again, I have a message taken from your feedback saying that learn about our award-winning work on climate change. So that award-winning would be hyperlinked to yeah. that award we have recently won on climate change. Yes. And then we are saying, demonstrating the value of geospatial technologies showcased at COP26. COP26 will have a link to the COP26 work we did and the Arctic Observation Summit, Arctic Observation Summit work we did. Then we would also have how we are advancing our work on geospatial ecosystem. Uh, when we say what we are doing on, we are working on geospatial policies that will have a hyperlink to the recent work we did on policies and then uh, on, on other aspects. So, and then we are trying to say who we work with at this next level, uh, who is our network, then this will have a page on our members and our leadership and the partner organizations we work on. And here comes another key piece you're talk talking about testimonials. 
so these are uh, at this point in time mostly textual uh, interviews that we are trying to create we are, have already reached few partners we will reach few members so initially we will do the text interviews which we should be easier for us to do and then we would go to those multimedia interviews at the second phase so for example here you see a case study uh, international telecommunications union is an international organization that we work with so we here we are trying to see why wgs is a valued partner on sgds for itu so in that interview uh, so here i said video I, I will say in this interview people can understand how ITU had a partnership with WJC uh, and how it helped the, the, the global organization to create geospatial knowledge in its ICT network um, with special focus on SGE. So I'm trying to put stories over here. Yes. And then the other things are knowledge resources that we produce, people can access and this kind of stuff. So uh, I'm really trying to take that feedback from you and trying to uh, put that. So I'll stop my sharing my screen now and I have a few questions for you uh yep. i just say stop sharing because one of the things that you've been talking about is uh, stories and humanizing stories right uh, we are a trade association and a knowledge building organization we don't directly work on ground uh, on humanitarian aspects okay. so we don't have those humanizing stories mostly That's so right. for our kind of organization how do we uh, one is tell stories uh, which actually uh, uh have that mind and heart aspect right how do you how do uh, thought leadership organizations like arts or knowledge building organizations like arts bring, bring those stories with both mind and heart good good first of all uh you're an excellent student i give you an a so far for uh, absorbing all the the lessons so far i was very pleased to to, to see that and and uh, you you make an excellent point so so yes you're not on the ground right but you're virtually on the ground, right? You're reaching out, you have your beneficiaries. And so then the question is, is how to humanize that, okay? And, and for example, just going back to, to, to your website right now, the About Us, okay? Right, so these, then I saw these are three, your three objectives, right? And then with each of those, applying to, to what you're saying, enhance the role of the industry and strengthen its contribution. You can take one of your clients, one of your companies, one of your members that you know that you've positively impacted, right? And then you take one individual at the forefront of that organization, the founder, the CEO, whomever, right? And similar, you follow the same fork in the road methodology, which is what was your situation like, you and your company? What was it like before? Describe her before you joined our, our uh, council, okay? We were doing this, we were doing that, but of course, to bring to light the challenges they faced, the struggles they faced, right? We were doing well with this, but we were challenged by that. We couldn't do this, we couldn't do that, et cetera, et cetera. But then there's that knock on the door, okay? The, the, the intervention. Then we learned about the WGIC. Then they approached us then this they could have attended or not attended they could have joined or not joined right had they not joined what would it be like we might still be struggling with this or that right instead we decided to follow harsha and his team we attended this we joined that and then you're writing this down and then what happened and then what happened and then what happened literally painstaking okay and the real value i should have mentioned this before the real value to that is you're demystifying for others if you put that story, Harsha, and you say, we want to broaden our network, our clientele, our membership and all. And of course, the other members, the prospective members would be very skeptical. Why should I join? Why would this be beneficial for me? And then they read some of these impact stories of the companies, of the members. They're like, they'll identify themselves within those stories. Oh, we faced a similar challenge, but now they're seeing step by step. Wow, the WGIC was able to help them this way and that way. You know, they're like, hey, team, let's get together. We need to join them because, right? And then they say, can you do for us like you did for them? Yes, exactly. Or Billion Strong, they read the story from Kenya, right? And say, like, hey, we have a similar situation here in Uganda, not very far away, right? Or from, from Cambodia, can you do for us like you did for them? Right, so that's what it is too. It's also providing a certain roadmap as far as, as how you awaken these organizations, how you activated them, how, you know, that sort of thing. So really to, to, 
to, to put your finger on the pulse of, you know, where exactly was the impact? Is, so it sounds, yeah. Sorry, it sounds like, Michael, then what you're saying to Harsha is that no matter what the organization of where it is in the chain of, of events, that there will always be a domino effect of yeah. impact. So it's really about trying to find and dig out where that impact happens, whether it's in your organization, the next one, or the people that they help. But someone will hopefully be positively impacted at some point. That's right. That's right. And that's why, that's why I encourage all organizations to get your team together and, and look at this as detective work. Okay? It's like there's an outline of a body that was on the, you know, the, 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 there's a victim here. Something happened here. Okay? Sherlock is on the case. You need to figure out what exactly happened. We can't just say we're impacting people. Yes, but how exactly step by step are you starting to impact and to show others that they'll be inspired to get involved, to demystify that process for them? How exactly are you impacting people? Not just the evidence, but how exactly are you doing it? We need that too. I mean, potentially someone could watch this video or this training and I'm demystifying. They could say, oh, now I understand. Can you come help us do this? So it's the same thing for you guys, each of your organizations as well, that there's so much value to, that's why I say impact, uh, evidence-driven impact stories, right? It's not just- Arsha, do you have, Arsha, you have another question for Michael? Yeah, please. Yeah, so uh, just that uh, I already had that in mind. So I, I would be doing two stories from my partners, two stories from my members not three, four. So to start with, so that's what I'm trying to do. And Michael has rightly said, ultimately, these stories would help me sell to new members because these members are skeptical, intelligent people yes. trying to question us, why should we join? What is the value? What is the value? So exactly. we are always talking that there is a value proposition, but there is the way stories would help to deliver that value proposition is more powerful than just we are saying that there is a value. That's right. And, and you know what it is, Harsha, too? It's also about uh, respect, showing respect for the intellect of your audience, right? You're not sheep-like. They are not sheep-like. They're not, join us. We promise it'll be beneficial. No, it doesn't work that way anymore, right? With a certain elite audience. And that's the elite audience we're aiming for, which is the critical thinking, skeptical audience. There's nothing wrong with being skeptical. But then we must recognize our need to overcome that skepticism. And, and like I said, and I'll repeat over and over again, the only way to do it, I believe, is with credible evidence and humanized content. It's a one-two punch of communications, I believe. Evidence and humanizing. Sure. Thank, Thank you, you so very much, much Michael. Can, can, can I make a quick point? Just yeah, really please. quick. Sure. One of the things that, that, that's important to us as an organization of Billion Strong is that language is very important. And I am 1,000% with you when you say, humanize the content, humanize the content, because what has happened so often is people with disabilities have been dehumanized. People with disabilities have been viewed as less than or something to be pitied. And that's why tugging on the heartstrings, that kind of language kind of kind of rubs me a little bit in terms of far as what we do. Yes. Um, but I also didn't want to leave the impression with this group and the people that are uh, a part of, of, of this training that for us, it's about the heart stream, but for us, it's about the empowerment. And for us, it's about finding what moves the donor, what moves, yes. um, what moves people who would contribute to the organization for us. But it's certainly not about a tier. <laughs> so and, thank and you. You're absolutely right. My, 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 my broader point really is, is I imagine a skeptic and my strategy is how to touch the mind and touch the heart because that combination can default can thaw you know their their suspicion can bring down that wall of distrust which is understandable right right because so many people out there are trying to scam or exaggerate or whatever the case may be you know what can can i give one more example just from yesterday that i think you, you all may find value in is so i'm working for the mekong river commission which is representing southeast asia's largest river right and my colleague there, the, the chief of communication said, Michael, we, we have this exchange program where the Mississippi River Commission is coming for a site visit for one week. Our colleagues are coming. What should we do to bring this to life? And I said, if you, what's, the, what's the objective here? What's the real aim? We want to promote 
this exchange program, the cooperation going on. Okay. I said, all right, who's coming over? And he identified two key figures from the Mississippi River Commission. And I said, how do you want to do? We talked about a video, even creating a documentary film. I brainstormed an idea for documentary film. I said, and again, I applied the, the, the fork in the road. I said, right now, this week, before they leave Mississippi, the Mississippi River, you could interview them about their expectations beforehand, what their situation, how they themselves got involved with protecting the Mississippi River, their background, then what they do or do not know about the Mekong River. So now we get some of the backstory. Then they knock on the door, they arrive in Southeast Asia, and then they're gonna be taken from one hydropower plant to one environmentally damaged place. And, and then we can start to show with interview and video, them interacting with their Southeast Asian colleagues. We can get their reactions or we get the lessons learned. But the real point is to show the, the value, the benefits of cooperation and exchange between the two, the, these two sides. And then we don't have to tell the audience, hey, this exchange program is meaningful, is impactful. We can show with the story, with the humanized story of the Mississippi River folks and the Mekong River folks interacting and learning from each other. Right. That is the ideal. So then you can say would you, to the donor, would you please continue supporting this exchange and cooperation relationship? Because I think that's works. I think that's a great point, because to Lamandre's point, you know, whenever you have ads on TV with, you know, Sarah McLaughlin singing, you know, and, and dogs with puppy dog eyes and, you know, like, there's so much marketing out there. And to your point at the very start. Michael, there's so much branding that to, you know, get through the noise and that not only are they trying to just do the harsh things, but they are trying to tap into an emotion. Yeah. And so it's, it's about doing emotion, but with evidence to really back it up as yeah. in That's right. this, this is emotional because it does affect people in their lives and you want to humanize the, um, the story behind it, but yeah. also show that it works. It yeah. isn't just, um, you know, whether it's empowerment, whether it is, uh, you know, helping people out of tragedy. Yes, yes, yes. Good. Um, I see that it's now 1230 New York time. Yes. Um, let's see. Well, one thing that, that we want to, to mention, too, you know, that, that we've discussed the possibility and we'd be happy to gauge within the audience is I've begun to demystify the process, but we're also considering offering a, an actual workshop, which would be four to five sessions, maybe over one month, once a week, to see whether anyone, any organization would be interested in joining, where then I lead one of your representatives through the actual process of producing an article, producing an impact story, that by the end of the four or five sessions, I guarantee, I guarantee you will walk away with a nearly polished but ready to publish story and that you'll know also the methodology for how you can create two, three, four more of your own. So I will lead you through even with you'll, you'll bring ideas, you'll bring the person you want to profile. I will lead you through the process step by step, including that you send me your first draft and I spend a couple hours written critiquing, then we oral critique in our next session, we talk about it, then you revise and polish, we discuss it some more, I critique and we polish it some more. And then by the end of the four or five sessions, it's done, it's more or less done, a little more cleanup, you upload, it's good to go. So we're talking about the possibility of that, we'd love to hear from you directly if you think there's value to that. Needless to say, that will not be a free workshop. So we also need to get a feel for what organizations or individuals would be willing to uh, to pay for that sort of thing. But we also want you to know that we are trying to practice what we preach and that Gail, our fearless uh, founder and CEO, will soon be heading to, to India to support one of her favorite Indian organizations, which is working with street children. And one of her main focal points of her trip there will be to document, to help the organization document the children they've rescued from the streets, okay, to show that impact. And again, one thing I'm suggesting, three to five exam symbolic examples, right, of show the intervention, then the step-by-step -step impact, how you've pulled them out of poverty, you set them on a healthier path 
living a, a, a productive life and then maybe even planting the seeds. Maybe they became street activists themselves, pulling others or trying to pull others off the street, that sort of thing. So um, I, I almost forgot to mention she's crowdfunding. Peter, do you have the uh, the link for that? Yes, Gail just put it in the uh, the link in the chat now. So if anyone is able to help, please do. Um, and just in, the, we have a question just from Giuseppe, if we have a few minutes, just because I think it's a really good question. Um, Michael, can you can your method be translated to individual activists too? And what would the difference be from the NGO's method? You know, uh, that, that's, that's a great question. And, and maybe to answer, I mean, of course an individual can do this. And I believe, you know, even with my own kids, but with all my students, I encourage everyone to, to get onto LinkedIn and start to create your own platform with your own impact. If you want to start to promote your own impact, of course, you can describe. Now, now uh, I should clarify, I didn't even get to the different storytelling forms, but you can produce these stories in the first person where you're writing the story, but as if in their voice, okay? Or you can write about it in the third person. And maybe this is what, what he's referring to is, I want to describe someone I met, here's what their situation was like before. And then there's a knock on the door, there's the intervention, and then starting to document how it affected their life. And you could say, then you insert, Again, within one, 200 words, they are one of, to also to work hard to recognize where is the symbolism? What do they symbolize? The bigger picture, the broader trends here. Okay, so yes, absolutely, individuals can and should, even from a personal professional standpoint, you wanna climb the career ladder and show that you are an impactful individual. Screw the organization looking out for yourself. Okay, that we should also start to document our own meaningful, impactful activities, our own products and services, that sort of thing. So I talk a lot about uh, personal brand building, not to mention organizational brand building. This is all a part of, of building our own brand. Yeah, because I mean, that comes for anything. Like if you're doing a resume, it was like, here yeah. was the company beforehand. This is what my impact was on that company so all of these um th this this uh can be applied to like absolutely anything so thank you so much michael for your time thank you lamandre harsha and my magic um thank you so much and for for taking part and thank you for everyone who has tuned in today we hope you all got so much out of it i know i did thank you this thank you fun. peter and thank you michael of course thank you all thank you connect Dave. Until we meet again. See ya. Indeed. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.